Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about another historic midterm election, the midterm election of 1994. It was during the first presidential term for Democrat Bill Clinton, and it was a landslide victory for the Republican Party, giving the Republicans a leadership of the House of Representatives for the first time since 1954. Republicans campaigned on what was called Contract with America. It would be seen as a pivotal pivotal moment in history for the Republican Party, a moment that would lead us to the Republican Party of today, perhaps. My guest for this is Jeffrey Cabot Service. Jeffrey Cabot Service is a historian and director of political studies at the Niskanen Center. He's the author of the book, Rule and Ruin, The Downfall of Moderation and the Destruction of the Republican Party from Eisenhower to the Tea Party. Jeffrey Cabot Service, always great to see you, sir. Thank you for taking this time to talk to me today about the 1994 midterm election. Always great to spend time with you, Mitch. Yesterday, we did a program on the 1934 midterm election, and specifically, we were looking at the realignment politically that was happening in the 1930s. Oddly, uh, before the 1930s, maybe not so odd, uh, Republicans actually seemed to dominate the Congress from the 1890s up to that point. Democrats take over in the 1930s. Another realignment occurs in which the Democrats are in control, at least of the House of Representatives, for the next, what, 60-plus years, except, I think, for one term in, in the 1950s. For a very short time, Republicans uh, had the leadership. Um, what was Before we get to 1994, what's important to know about the Republican Party between this period of time, of sort of the New Deal era and the 1990s? I think one thing that's important for your listeners to take into account is that the norm in American history has been for there to be a dominant party for long stretches of time. And as you say, it was the Republican Party up until uh, the late 1920s, and then it was the Democratic Party. Um, so the period that we've been living through the last three decades where power alternates really between Republicans and Democrats back and forth, that's the unusual uh, pattern in American history. And I think a lot of our dysfunctions spring from the fact that neither party has really seized a durable majority in the way that the pre-New uh, Deal Republican Party did and in the way that the post-New uh, Deal Democratic Party did. So the thing about the Republican Party is that having grown used to their role as the natural governing party following the Civil War, uh, they were very discomfited and split about how to respond to Franklin Delano Roosevelt's ascension uh, to dominant power and the Democrats long hold over really both houses of Congress. Um, and there was one faction which was very much uh, rooted in the kind of um, Calvin Coolidge uh, conservatism, which thought that everything the New Deal did was anathema, um, that America needed to return to laissez-faire capitalism and rugged individualism. And that when the Republican Party came back into power, they would sweep away every vestige of the New Deal. And then a faction that thought that um, the New Deal had really proven something about America's need for stability and security. And that to sweep away the New Deal would actually be a radical act. And so what you really had in the Republican Party was this split between uh, the two factions, which could be called conservative and moderate. And the epitome of the conservative faction was Senator Robert Taft, who was a longtime aspirant for the presidential nomination on the Republican side, and three times he went for it and was denied. Um, and then what proved to be the incarnation of the moderate Republicans, which was Dwight Eisenhower. Of course, the, the famous World War II general who had led the Allied forces to victory in Europe, um, but also somebody who was a fiscal conservative, but thought that doing away with the New Deal would be very damaging. Um, and as it turned out, it was Eisenhower whose vision triumphed. Um, and Eisenhower did prove to be both a very fiscally conservative president, but also a great unifier who was very popular during his time in office. But he had limited coattails. Um, so as you say, he did actually get uh, a, a congressional majority uh, when he first came into office following the 1952 election. But that didn't endure. And what then followed was 40 years of Republicans being in the wilderness uh, up until the 1994 uh, House elections. That's that's interesting. And, and what's interesting about Eisenhower is some on the far right, people like from the John Birch Society would accuse him of being a communist. For, for many, he wasn't considered, and I, I guess this is a minority, but he wasn't considered uh, conservative enough or 
or, or too willing to work with the New Dealers, I guess? So the John Birch Society, which was, you know, the most extreme organization out there in some ways on the anti-communist world, uh, did in fact claim that uh, Dwight Eisenhower was a dedicated conscious agent of the communist conspiracy. Um, what's very different about then and now is that the conservative movement, uh, which was really, I guess, uh, mostly located at that point in the National Review publication, which started in 1955 under the editor-in-chief ship of William F. Buckley Jr., uh, marginalized the Birch Society uh, and said, this is, this is crazy. We want no part of that conspiracy theorizing about Dwight Eisenhower. But at the same time, what's interesting is that the modern conservative movement, epitomized by people like Bill Buckley and William Rusher, who was the publisher of National Review, that all started in reaction against Dwight Eisenhower. He was their leading villain figure. And that's precisely because, as they saw it, he had betrayed the conservative movement by failing to rip up the New Deal. Um, and they actually thought that, you know, Dwight Eisenhower blew the chance for Republicans to come back into power and restore that dominant uh, pre-New Deal domi uh, uh, world of Republican authority. Uh, precisely because he was too willing to offer what Barry Goldwater, the 1964 Republican presidential nominee, called uh, a dime store New Deal. Um, and, you know, so essentially uh, what you had is this conservative movement going against that vision of modern republicanism, which eventually comes to fruition with Ronald Reagan's election to the presidency in 1980. What you said about enduring leaderships, where, where this was the norm in history of having a party dominate for Congress for, for, for decades, seems important. Um, is it if you have leadership long enough, then you are actually able to uh, see out your your plans, your your policy agenda, rather than just this sort of ping pong back and forward, what what we've experienced in more recent time? Well, I think it's um I think that's a, a true observation, but I would more put it on two levels. Um, I would say that, uh, 1932 was a realigning election in the sense that the working class, which is the vast majority of Americans at that time, had mostly supported Republicans prior to that period. And then they came to feel that Franklin Delano Roosevelt's vision, uh, which involved much more active government, much more active support for people who were facing hard times because of the Great Depression, was in their interest. And so they moved over to the Democratic column en masse. Um, and, you know, you could argue that someone like Ronald Reagan was able to, in some ways, bring the Reagan Democrats into the Republican column because his vision of the world more closely fitted the way that they saw themselves, uh, their view of America, their view of what the future was to be. Um, but on the other hand, someone like Reagan was much less able than a Franklin Roosevelt was to implement his vision, uh, precisely because he was dealing with uh, a Democratic Congress and trying to put forward Republican initiatives. Whereas Franklin Roosevelt had vast majorities, I mean, super majorities, really, for much of the New Deal. Uh, and the Democrats had that again, following the 1964 wipeout of Barry Goldwater in that presidential election, which handed Lyndon Johnson a kind of New Deal type supermajority to pass the Great Society, which in effect was really a, a second New Deal. So it really has been a long time since Republicans have had either the governing vision or uh, the vast public majority support or unified control of government to pass what they have wanted to pass. And that accounts for some of the frustrations that you still see on the right. I'm zeroing in on this this seemingly permanent minority status that Republicans had in the House of Representatives, because I think it's important to understand to, when we get to what happened in the 1994 midterm election. One last question about this period. If you were a Republican, perhaps a moderate Republican, and you are against in the seemingly permanent minority, were you in a situation in which, OK, I'll have to work with the Democratic leadership and then I can still get some things, maybe get some things to bring back to my district so I could still be uh, an effective congressional member? Let me let me go at that question in a somewhat side about way. Um, you know, I think part of the bad hand that Republicans had during the New Deal era is not just that they failed to speak for the working class in the same way that the Democrats did. Um, it's that the position that Dwight Eisenhower was identified with was fiscal conservatism and social tolerance. 
Um, but fiscal conservatism is an inherently unpopular idea. Uh, the idea of cutting back the budget is never going to be appealing, I think, to a majority of Americans, except when they think it's absolutely necessary. And that's part of why we've ended up in this situation now where neither party really can claim to be fiscally conservative at all. Um, Republicans ran up the budget when Trump was in president and Democrats are running up the budget now that Biden is president. And no one is calling for uh, a serious uh, set of mutual compromises, uh, mutual sacrifices that would actually bring the debt down uh, because that's simply not the way that politics is played nowadays. So, but going back, so, you know, you had 40 years where Republicans were in the wilderness uh, in a seemingly permanent minority. And yeah, what you then saw, uh, you know, did to some extent validate some of the conservative critique. Uh, Republicans and Democrats saw the national problems in more or less similar terms, although Republicans would sometimes uh, propose different means for solving what they agreed on were the same ends of national improvement. Um, and someone like Barry Goldwater could say that this meant that Republicans were just trying to be Tweedledee to Tweedledum or vice versa um, and weren't pro pro you know, proposing the kind of radical alternative that could really gain conservatives the majority again. Um, and, you know, again, it is true that a lot of uh, Republicans during that era just tried to cut the best deals that they could with the Democrats who were in power. Um, and there was a little more of a power sharing arrangement in the Senate just because the Senate is that kind of body. Um, but, you know, the House really is set up so that the majority can do almost whatever it wants. And if they if the Democrats had wanted to shut out Republicans during that era, they could have. And sometimes they did. Um, but the Democrats really up through uh, into the 1990s, uh, you have to remember that they were both the most progressive element in Congress, but in some ways also the most conservative. Because the Democrats still relied very much in that era on the strength of the Southern Democrats. Um, who supported Jim Crow uh, and Southern segregation. And it was an odd and probably ultimately unstable compromise um, because, you know, it became increasingly evident that the kind of hideous segregation that existed in the South was just antithetical to America's ideals and also a, a real hindrance to America's taking the leadership of the free world because the Soviet Union and other communist states incessantly pointed out, you know, you claim to be about freedom and democracy, and yet you deny this to uh, one-sixth of your own citizens. So that was always a bit of a contradiction on the Democratic side, and Republicans, to their credit, during the 1950s and 1960s, were not trying to out-segregate the Democrats. Um, Barry Goldwater had proposed doing that, and in fact, during the election of 1964, the only places that he won were in the old Confederacy. But that was not the approach the Republican Party took, even though they got close to it with something like Richard Nixon's Southern strategy. Uh, but basically what we're waiting on into the 1990s is a time when Southerners are going to start voting for their congressional candidates, uh, Republican, in the same way that they actually have off and on been voting for Republican candidates for president since Dwight Eisenhower. So that's interesting. In the South, they were still congressional Congressionally, they were still voting for Democrats while they were voting for Republican presidents. You know, my understanding, uh, and I could have this wrong because it's been a while since I've gone back to look at the history, is that the 1994 congressional election is notable not only because that's when Republicans come back into power after a 40-year absence, but also because that's the first time that a majority of Southern districts vote for a Republican candidate instead of a Democrat. That's interesting. For the first time ever. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation about the 1994 midterm election, which we haven't gotten to yet, but we're about to. Our guest is Jeffrey Cabaservice. Jeffrey Cabaservice is historian and director of political studies at the Niskanen Center, and he is the author of the book Rule and Ruin, The Downfall of Moderation and the Destruction of the Republican Party from Eisenhower to the Tea Party. Uh, again, leading into 1994, a little bit before this, I, I think it's in the late 1970s, we get the election to Congress from Georgia, a southern state, of Newt Gingrich. Tell me about the significance of the election of Newt Gingrich. Well, Newt Gingrich uh, is an interesting figure, uh, in many ways a destructive figure, but also kind of a unique figure. Uh, Newt Gingrich, when he first enters politics, is actually campaigning for Nelson Rockefeller in the state of Louisiana in the 1968 election. A moderate. Nelson Rockefeller was the governor of New York and, and a leader, really, of the progressive faction. Mm -hmm. 
So Gingrich, when he first entered politics, saw that as his uh, identity as well, that he was a progressive Republican in support of civil rights and civil liberties and actually um, big government, although maybe not quite as big as the kind of great society government that the Democrats were putting forward. Um, but Gingrich has always had this ability to sort of be on every side of an argument um, and also uh, definitely has a, a well-earned reputation as an opportunist. So he ends up as a college professor at a small uh, university in Georgia and has the idea to run for office. And he loses the first time because he's seen as being kind of a carpetbagger and an outsider. But he then tilts towards being much more conservative and even a kind of populist conservative and wins elections and starts uh, his rise through the Republican ranks. Um, and it's very critical also that, um, you know, before he became speaker, he actually became House Whip, uh, which is kind of the number two position. Um, and that set him up to bring his brand of conservatism to the wider Republican Party. Yeah, House Whip is interesting. That that's the, they call it the whip because you are whipping your party or your caucus uh, into into a voting pattern that they can get the votes uh, in order in order to to win. Is Newt Gingrich and uh, maybe other lawmakers around the same time are, are they l looking at the situation in in the recent history? And again, uh, Newt Gingrich well, is is a historian. Um, looking at this is like we're we're not we're no longer going to be this party that's expected to be in the permanent minority willing to work with the Democratic leadership. We're, we're coming to fight them. So here's something to consider about the Republican Party in the early 1990s. Um, it at that point is still an ideologically diverse party. There are still significant numbers of Eisenhower style moderates and even some progressives who are in the party, even though the ranks of conservatives are growing. Um, but what this means is that conservatives, moderates, progressives are all actually united during that period in their frustration that they've been out of power for so long. And they also feel that the Democrats have become arrogant through their long dominance uh, of Congress. And they are ceasing to pay uh, attention to uh, the Republicans needs, uh, the needs of the Republicans constituents. And they're starting to just govern unilaterally. And they really want to change the situation. And this is what gives Newt Gingrich an opening. Because what he actually says to Republicans is that, you know, essentially we face a unified power structure here. Um, and the only way uh, to get over this situation is to go through it in some sense. Um, what we actually have to do is to some extent smash the Democratic Party's power and delegitimize Congress as an institution so that we can actually take over and then make it a fairer and more balanced institution. That at any rate is the proposition that he puts forward. And this is what leads all factions of the party to support him when he's first uh, elected to the whip in 1989, I believe. Um, he gets support from moderates as well, even though they know that what he's proposing is immoderate, because it seems that he's the only figure in the party with the strength and the charisma to actually bring the party back to power. Uh, they're desperate at this point. So he is a figure uh, who speaks to that desperation. And this unifying force would lead to the 1994 midterm election and their victory? Yes. Um, but I think it's a little more complicated than the story that we usually tell. Um, the story that's usually told is that Newt Gingrich makes the Republicans a super conservative force, that the contract with America is a super conservative program and that it's all right wingery from there on out. Um, there's an excellent book by Nicole Hemmer that's come out recently called Partisans, which looks back to the 1990s. Um, and one of the points that she makes is that, you know, if you're looking for antecedents to Trumpism, you could certainly find them uh, in someone like Newt Gingrich, who brings that note of scorched earth populism to the Republican Party. But you can also find it in um, with the end of the Cold War and that funny 1992 presidential campaign of Ross Perot. And Ross Perot is not really a conservative, even though he probably draws more heavily uh, from conservative votes than he does uh, from Democratic votes during that uh, election. Um, Perot is, uh, for example, in support, supportive of abortion rights and gun control. Um, but his big issue is that the government is overspending, that deficits are bad, um, that immigration is bad, and that America needs to become great again, so to speak. Um, and the people that he's appealing to are mostly Democratic voters that he's that he's 
Republicans and Democratic voters, but people who actually feel left out and left behind um, across the country, people who are dealing with uh, the decline of industry, uh, the rise of Japan, which at that point was America's leading competitor, the loss of good middle class uh, factory jobs that for decades had undergirded uh, the American way of life. And so Perot speaks to that frustration and Republicans want to get those Perot voters into their own column. And this actually means that the contract with America, which is a list of sort of promises of what they'll pass once they actually regain the House majority, um, is actually not as extreme in a conservative sense as rumor would later have it. Um, in fact, Newt Gingrich explicitly uh, leaves out everything that we would now think of as culture war issues. Uh, there's no mention of abortion in the contract with America. It's rather narrowly focused on procedural reforms uh, and again, what we would think of as fiscal conservatism. So Newt Gingrich, in a weird way, actually has the Republican Party campaigning more in the Dwight Eisenhower model uh, of moderation than he does in the Barry Goldwater model of, of scorched earth conservatism. But then once Gingrich actually takes over, he actually moves the Republican Party much more in that direction of uh, really radical conservatism. Uh, even though that wasn't what the 1994 election was was run on, really. Again, Republicans win with, with a landslide in 1994 uh, Congress. Uh, what what this is Bill Clinton's first term as president. Um, he's now in office for two years when almost two years when this election happens. What's what's going on in the country to cause such a landslide victory? Is there major discontent with the Clinton presidency at this point? So Bill Clinton represents the first coming of the baby boom into the presidency. Um, and there's a lot of people who are uncomfortable with the baby boom and what it represents, um, even though in hindsight, Bill Clinton was a fairly conservative Democrat, which you would understand coming from his background as an Arkansas governor. Um, but, you know, this is really sort of a, the, the moment, I think, when a lot of culture war issues do strike home uh, with Republicans, even though the Republican Party as a whole is not running on them, when there's a feeling that... Uh, Democrats are soft on crime. Um, some of these complaints that do go back to the McGovern uh, candidacy of 1972, um, and also just a feeling that Bill Clinton is is bringing in big government, and that this is this is a problem, and people want to see something more like the America that they remembered, uh, which is changing in in directions they don't like. And some of what Bill Clinton is doing, remember, is also turning the Democratic Party toward neoliberalism. And so there's kind of a, a reaction against things like NAFTA, even though that was proposed by Ronald Reagan uh, when he was running for the presidency in 1980, that there would be a sort of North American free trade accord. Um, you know, the feeling is that Demo the Democrats are moving away from the working class in which they've been rooted and moving towards something more like what they are now, which is increasingly a party of the college educated professionals um, who hold a lot of. Uh, academic influenced ideas that the working class finds alien. So, you know, in a weird way, it's kind of hard to say what it is that people don't like about Bill Clinton. Um, some of it for some people comes down to his playing a saxophone on Arsenio Hall, to talking with MTV voters about his preference for boxers over briefs. There's a feeling that this is unpresidential as people have come to think of presidential behavior. I never inhaled. Yeah, exactly. You know, that the baby boomers are coming in and they're going to change everything and make it worse. Um, so that that's some of what we're seeing during that 1994 election. It's very interesting. And I think you hit on an important point here. Before this, the Democratic Party was still seen as the party of the working people. Yes, um, very much so. But, you know, let's also be honest. There is an element, as always, in American politics of racial unease as well. Um, and... You know, when President Lyndon Johnson had signed uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he supposedly had said to his aide, Bill Moyer, well, there goes the Democratic South for a generation. And it turned out to be longer than a generation, but he was right. Um, as the Democrats moved unequivocally towards being the party of civil rights, and as Republicans backslid on their past reputation as the party of Lincoln um, and equal opportunity and uh, um, uh, fair treatment for all American citizens. You did see a sort of gradual reshaping of where the parties stood for and what kind of appeals they had to different segments of the white working class. 
Um, so all of that is definitely going on during this period. Um, and that, again, makes politics uglier in a way than it had been when civil rights was more or less the, the, the thing that large factions of both the Republican and Democratic parties wanted to support. Tell me more about what happens with Newt Gingrich and he becomes Speaker of the House of Representatives uh, after the 1994 uh, election. So with the 19, the, the session that begins in 1995, uh, t tell me more about his shift after he becomes Speaker of the House of Representatives. Well, you know, what Newt Gingrich does really is revert to form. Um, so I actually reviewed a book that came out uh, a few years ago uh, by Julian Zelizer called Burning Down the House. There's actually been a lot of books called Burning Down the House lately. Um, but it was a, a profile of Gingrich and his impact on the Republican Party before he actually was elected as speaker. Um, and it talks about the ways that I've already alluded to in which Gingrich sought to divide um, not just Congress, but to divide the American people themselves. Um, and he wanted Republicans to be much more aggressive and hostile toward Democrats. He wanted to accentuate um, the polarization uh, and partisanship of the American people themselves, as well as to bring about a kind of general uh, disesteem for government uh, and Congress as an institution. So this kind of scorched earth approach that I was talking about. Um, and Julian Zellers' book is excellent in talking about all the ways that Newt Gingrich conspired to bring down House Speaker Jim Wright, uh, the Democrat, um, in ways that were really deeply unfair because um, essentially Wright profited off of the publication of an autobiography in exactly the same way that Newt Gingrich later would profit off of his own autobiography. Um, but again, it was part of the larger project of Gingrich to uh, really make Americans hate government and to make as many people in the working class as possible feel that Democrats were their class enemies at this point um, and that they were traitors and sick and wrong. And, you know, the story is often told of how Gingrich would send out, uh, I think, VCR tapes, as the technology was then, uh, teaching aspiring or actual Republican candidates for office how to speak like Newt um, and how to avoid even the appearance of bipartisanship. How, how do you so, speak it, like Newt? Again, by, by sort of referring to Democrats as traitors and aliens and people who are not your opponents, but really your enemies, uh, and as people who maybe even actively seek the destruction of the United States. So Gingrich, um, by taking this approach, was actually bringing into the mainstream of the party the kind of John Birch-style extremism that uh, previous conservative leaders like William F. Buckley Jr. had sought to cauterize, in a way, uh, to sort of wall off and say, that's the crackpot right, those are the kooks, those aren't actually what the conservative movement or its leaders stand for. Um, and I think we've now sort of seen the full mainstreaming uh, of that kind of extremism in the Republican Party. And a lot of it does go back to what Gingrich did during those critical years. The taking down of Jim Wright. Jim Wright's the Democratic leader in 1995? That's right. Uh, and a Texas Democrat, if I'm remembering correctly. So again, one of those sort of more Southern style Democrats, although he was not an overt segregationist in the way that previous generations of Southern uh, Democrats had been. It's interesting in thinking about how Newt Gingrich sort of brought together the different factions or the different forces within the Republican Party before 1994. It, it reminds me of kind of what we see, I think, with revolutions all over the world. Uh, when you have a revolution, you usually do have disparate factions of society together because they have a common goal of toppling whoever the leader is. And once they, if they achieve that, then afterwards, the infighting starts to determine uh, who the new leadership will be. Does the infighting begin here in the Republican Party after the 1994 election? That's a good question. Um, I think one of the things that Newt Gingrich does is that he actually changes the old seniority system in a way that makes uh, a Republican's position on a committee, uh, a Republican's assignment to a committee, much more the province of leadership rather than seniority. So Gingrich gets to decide who goes where and the basis of who goes where and who gets what particular plums uh, really is a function of their loyalty toward Gingrich himself. Um, so this, again, is, is sort of a, a delegitimization of the old system and a movement toward a much more kind of personal leadership. And there's something similar that happens on the Democratic side over time as well. So what you really get 
is a kind of centralizing process where most of the decisions about legislation are restricted to a handful of people uh, on in both parties. And this actually is part of the discontent that you'll often hear from office holders, again, from both parties, particularly in the House, that they don't really have a meaningful role to play anymore. In 1995, the Republicans, in a standoff with President Bill Clinton, uh, now, you know, this is after the election, this is with them in control of the of, of Congress, um, bring about a, a government shutdown. Uh, now, today we talk about government shutdown. We've had a number of them. It you know, doesn't seem as it, it is a serious thing, but a little more common now. But at this moment, it was extraordinary to have a government shutdown in 1995. Um, what's important to know about the government shutdown? It seems like a significant moment here. So, again, I think, you know, one of the ways that you can connect Gingrich to Trump is that they are both norm breakers. Um, they are very much going against the way that um, that parties uh, had operated uh, really through most of American history. But again, those were not things that were written down in law or legislation. Those were just the expectations of behavior, uh, how parties would conduct themselves. And the expectation had been that parties would treat their opponents fairly when they were in power. Um, but the expectation had also been that they would not do ungentlemanly, uh, dirty tricks, uh, bad tactics of that sort against the other party. And Gingrich really starts breaking all of that down. Um, and I think that's part of what's significant uh, about this, this, the shutdown. It, it wasn't that no one had ever thought this was possible prior to that time. It was just that people in both parties thought that the United States' full faith and credit, uh, its reputation in the world was too important a thing to risk uh, by uh, trying to actually uh, really f force a debt default in order to get your way, your way uh, in a partisan manner. So Gingrich, you know, is sort of seizing on, you know, a sort of nuclear option, uh, uh, if you will. And um, it doesn't work. Uh, as it turns out, you know, there is nothing that uh, a shutdown would do that would induce Democrats to uh, repeal Bill Clinton's program, which really was what Gingrich was asking for at that point. Which program? Uh, or, or just well, like... his program as a whole, but, you know, his moves towards uh, health care, um, his, his various government uh, investments uh, of various kinds. So, you know, it doesn't work. Um, but this doesn't mean that Republicans won't go back to the tactic now that the norm has been broken. Um, and, you know, furthermore, this actually becomes the, the point at which a lot of the Republican Party starts feeling that uh, no government is better than government controlled by their, their enemies, the Democrats. It's interesting, the relationship of Bill Clinton to the Republican-controlled Congress. Um, of course, you have this government shutdown. You also, this would be later, you have the impeachment of Bill Clinton. At the same time, we, we see measures like welfare reform, other measures that he actually strikes deals with, with Republicans in Congress. If that's not entirely right, you'll, you'll correct me on that. But but you, you said earlier, and I, I think this is accurate, We should, people shouldn't have been surprised by Bill Clinton as more of a, a conservative Democrat, considering his, his background. Um, but there's also a thought that Bill Clinton was brought, and even the Democratic Party in general, brought further to the right or moved towards the right because of this Republican leadership in, in, in Congress during the 90s? So Bill Clinton um, came out of the Democratic Leadership Council, which was an organization uh, that was set up essentially to try to move the Democrats back towards being uh, a mainstream party. It was a reaction to the major Nixon triumph in the 1972 election. Um, which was a, a real landslide and suggested that the George McGovern approach um, was just wrong and, and was going to be rejected by the American people. Um, and Bill Clinton, as I said, was uh, the governor of Arkansas. And it was really a lot of those Southern governors who were Democrats who were pushing this approach. And, you know, the 1994 election was really shocking to Democrats who had become used to thinking of themselves as America's natural governing party. Um, and it made them think that there was something to this charge, that they were out of step with where the majority of the American people were at that point, uh, that maybe it was, after all, a center-right country, and that they would have to triangulate, as as the term went. And so this led to um, 
uh, Republican and Democratic negotiations on welfare reform, for example, uh, to Bill Clinton saying that the era of big government is over. And there were behind the scenes negotiations, uh, which are laid out in a book by Stephen Gillen called uh, The Pact, which would have actually brought about a kind of um, reform of Social Security and Medicare and uh, the big entitlement programs, as well as um, Republicans giving a little more legitimacy, I guess, to the Democrats and and Bill Clinton's presidency. Those fell apart uh, when the revelations about Monica Lewinsky became public. Um, but it's interesting because Newt Gingrich really was actually trying to govern during that time, even if behind the scenes, um, even at the same time that he was also kind of pointing the Republicans in the direction which they have now reached, where they are hostile to the very effort to govern. So Gingrich is, again, a complex and contradictory character in many ways. Um, and there's a lot of different cross pressures uh, on Republicans and Democrats during this time. What was, in, in your view, what, what was the point of impeachment of President Bill Clinton in, in, in the late 1990s? Of course, this is something in the process of this that would bring down Newt Gingrich as well. Yeah, um, you know, Bill Clinton got caught uh, as having uh, had an affair with Monica Lewinsky and then lied about it. And, you know, this was, again, reinforcing some feelings that Republicans had had earlier, that Clinton was a libertine, that he was a slippery figure, um, that Democrats were not to be trusted, um, and that he had actually betrayed his role uh, as the leader of the free world by this kind of immorality. Um, but it was also, at this point, that a kind of performative conservatism enters into the picture, because... Everyone knew that since Democrats controlled the Senate, they were not going to go along with a vote to remove Bill Clinton, even if there was a vote in the House to impeach. Um, but nonetheless, this sort of proceeded. It was an effort to humiliate Clinton, uh, which in some ways it did. Uh, he was the first president impeached since uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, Lincoln's successor. Uh, but of course, he was not uh, convicted in the Senate. He was not removed from office. And ultimately, what uh, the whole impeachment process did was make it look like the Republicans were just being uh, babies and sore losers um, who were trying to strike back at Clinton, but also really at America's strength and unity in a way that American people just rejected. Because um, keep in mind, the Clinton years were also years of um, great prosperity for many Americans, uh, as well as significant peace uh, that followed the end of the Cold War. So Americans, generally speaking, liked the direction in which the country was headed, even if they might not have approved of everything that Bill Clinton did in his private life. Um, and so what you actually saw in 1998, I want to say, um, was a, a set of midterm elections that actually went against the typical post-World War II pattern, um, where the Democrats actually picked up votes in the House, even though they didn't yet regain control uh, of the majority. So Gingrich's... Uh, approach his tactics had been seen widely to backfire that lost him the confidence of his colleagues uh, on the republican caucus and he then ceased to become speaker of course today's republicans especially on the, on the farther right spectrum of, of the republican party kind of despise i think the presidency of george w bush that would come to follow uh is there after this what happens in with the impeachment is there, is there a, a momentary uh, pause towards this far right movement within the Republican Party during the Bush years? Well, you know, again, uh, you would expect in the natural course of things that if America was as prosperous uh, as it was going into the 2000 election, if we seemingly controlled the world uh, as the, the only hyper power that the American people would seek to reward the party that had done so much to get them to that point. And therefore, you would expect I think in the normal course of business that Al Gore would have won the presidential election of 2000 in a landslide. Um, but again, mm -hmm. continuing unease about Bill Clinton among both Republicans and Democrats meant that Al Gore didn't really run uh, with the full support of Clinton or point toward the accomplishments of the administration in which he had been the vice president. Um, and this led to George W. Bush's very narrow victory. Now, W. Bush became, I think, a very conservative ideological president, particularly after 9-11. Um, but keep in mind that when he was running in 2000, he actually was um, the candidate of compassionate conservatism. And compassionate conservatism wasn't quite 
the Dwight Eisenhower moderation of old, but it was an attempt to leaven conservatives, uh, the fiscal conservatism of the Republican Party with some sort of understanding and empathy of the needs of uh, minority Americans and particularly Americans who are facing financial difficulties. And also keep in mind that Bill Clinton uh, uh, had, again, sort of presided over this per perceived um, uh, bonus from the Cold War ending, uh, the, the Cold War dividend, as it was called. And George W. Bush was not running as an interventionist candidate. He actually was saying that uh, America needs a humble foreign policy, not one that is sort of a quasi-imperialistic policy. Um, and that was convincing enough to enough Americans that he you know, eked out that victory in the Electoral College with perhaps an assist from a conservative-dominated Supreme Court. Um, and initially, Bush did govern as uh, a compassionate conservative, one who worked very closely, for example, with Senator Ted Kennedy on the passage of the No Child Left Behind Educational Reform Act. Um, but all of American politics uh, was deeply affected by the 9-11 attack, and Bush thereafter became really a sort of war on terror president more than any kind of compassionate conservative. Between 2003 and 2006, I was a congressional reporter. I was a beat reporter on Congress. And as I look back on that time now, I, I didn't realize it in the moment, but maybe we don't always realize the trends that are occurring in the moment. But when I look back on that period now, I, I see it as a moment of transition in, in Congress. And I guess there are many different transitions that we've talked about already. But I look back, there are still many from sort of the old guard, what some considered the golden era of the Senate. You had Ted Kennedy there. Robert Byrd was still there. On the other side, you had people like Old Ted Stevens, um, Arlen Specter was still a Republican when when I was there before he switched party again. Um, yeah. And and but what I remember from that period is those older senators, and there are, there are many others. Um, those older senators continually decrying what they were seeing happen in the Senate, how politics were changing in the Senate. This is when we start to hear about the so called nuclear option of taking away the filibuster for judicial picks. I remember uh, d Democrats spending the night uh, keeping session open all night, bring, you know, the staff bringing cots in so senators could sleep on the Senate floor and, and things. And, it, you know, it was all political theater. Looking back on this, though, I, I see in where we are now, I, I very much I, I look back at my time in Congress as like, oh, this was a transitional period on how politics worked. One from where the and, and this is sort of I think the norm from after the the Great Depression, one from where the idealized politics was trying to reach across the aisle and and make a deal to get policy passed to one now that is more sort of entrenched warfare. You know, there's some danger uh, in excessive nostalgia for a supposed vanished golden age. Um, Obviously, the slogan, Make America Great Again, begs the question of what was the era that you considered to have been great? Well, it was the 1950s, and there were a lot of Americans who actually did not enjoy the, the full prosperity of that era and were even second-class citizens during that time. You could even say that America was not a full-fledged democracy during the 1950s. And the same is true of every era in which you want to go back. Um, but on the other hand, it really does feel like the dynamic of American public life over the last two decades has been one of, of worsening uh, national unity, worsening civility, worsening polarization and partisanship. Um, Julia Ioffe has a newsletter called Tomorrow Will Be Worse. And I think that's a, kind of the operating slogan for, for the days that we're living through. So yes, uh, in that period you're talking about, in the early 2000s, there were still a number of people in both parties, in both houses of Congress, who looked back to an earlier and better time when both parties had been better able to work together to solve the common problems of the American people when there had been more people who could put um, country above party, when there had been more statesmen and stateswomen, if you will. Um, and I think there was a real feeling that that environment was deteriorating year by year, driven not only by the ambitions of particular politicians like Newt Gingrich, um, but also by a sense on both sides of the aisle that they could not get along with the other side, that the other side were more enemies than they were opponents, and that their program could not be permitted to, to pass.
think you, what you said there first was, was really important about who was it a golden era for. And, and I don't mean to call it a golden era. It's just sort of oftentimes referred to as the golden era uh, of the Senate. And something I've, I've thought about that in line with what you were saying is during this so-called golden era where lawmakers on both sides of the aisle were striking deals, it was especially in the Senate, with, well, there are a few exceptions, but it was mostly white men, even if they were from different political parties. In large part, there were pro- they had probably very some some you know similarities uh, uh, that that were important as well. Today, Congress is more diverse, and this is not an argument to have a less diverse Congress. I think we should be more have a more diverse Congress that represents the entire country. But but I I wonder if that also that diversity, including from white lawmakers who are may, maybe even uncomfortable with the diversity, if if that is also making affecting the way that politics are done today? Well, you know, it's a paradox that as the Congress and really both parties become more diverse, um, we also are uh, less able to get along and come together to solve our problems. Um, On the one hand, it's a good development that we are becoming more accepting of each other's differences, and yet that is not translated into political acceptance uh, of other people's perspectives. You know, but I also think it's true that there are certain historical events that cast long echoes uh, through American public life. And I'm thinking of the shared sacrifices of the Depression, when it seemed that we really all did have to come together, uh, as well as the struggles of World War II. And one of the notable aspects of Congress in the decades following World War II is not just that it's an era of democratic dominance, but that it's an era when so many of the people serving had also served in the military. Um, And that gave them, I think, a certain baseline of respect for each other that vanished um, as they ceased to share that uh, leveling, important shared distinction. Um, So I think, you know, it becomes much harder also uh, to get along with people if you don't really know them. Um, I think, you know, as much as anything, the innovation of of jet airplanes is what breaks some of the unity of Congress, because no longer... Do you get elected from, let's say, Montana and relocate your family to Washington, D.C., where your wives get to know your your wife gets to know someone in the uh, uh, the Democratic Party, if you're Republican or if you're elected uh, as a Democrat, your husband gets to know uh, someone across the aisle just through the course of attending school meetings and the like. Um, It's harder to demonize somebody when you actually know them and even maybe count them as a friend and to say all Democrats are terrible or all Republicans are terrible. But increasingly what happens is you actually get uh, the three day a week Congress that we have now where people come to Washington, they don't move their families here. Um, they'll sleep on a cot in their office and they'll spend the rest of their uh, you know, uh, Thursday through uh, Monday uh, back in their districts, raising money, making speeches, demonizing the opponents. So we're really living in a much more divided Washington, D.C. now uh, than we were before. Yeah, Thursday afternoons, you see a lot of lawmakers leaving the Capitol building with their suitcases. You do. Uh, And it's actually shocking how few uh, members of the opposing party most uh, legislators really do now know, know well. And that's a big change from what had existed in the past. Jeffrey Cabaservice has been our guest. He has joined us to talk about the history of the midterm election and more. Jeffrey Cabaservice is a historian. He's director of political studies at the Niskanen Center, and he is the author of the book Rule and Ruin, The Downfall of Moderation and the Destruction of the Republican Party from Eisenhower to the Tea Party. Jeffrey Cabaservice, that was fascinating and and, and in-depth and insightful. Thank you. Good to be with you, uh, Mitch. I I wish I could be a little more cheery, um, but I do actually kind of feel that tomorrow will be worse. So looking forward to talking to you whenever that is, but I doubt I'll be feeling much more optimistic then. We will be coming to you. (laughs) Okay, I look forward to it.